of those series where uh, we, we come back to you on occasion to talk about big topics that uh, are not really, they don't fit into a series necessarily, but there's stuff that are important that we want to talk about. So uh, for today, we're going to do this within groups. So you can spread out into your small groups and uh, then we'll get started here. I'll give you just a minute to get there. And then once you get into your group, I want you to tell your group about the last thing that made you laugh really hard. Okay? Uh, and small group leaders, if you open the Lead Small app, there are the questions in there and when we're breaking them up throughout the message. So, tell us about the last thing that made you laugh really hard. I'll give you guys just a couple minutes to do this within your group. Stuff that makes you laugh really hard. Uh, <laughs> for me, that's fart humor. So, that's the last thing I probably laughed at really hard. Um, our small group was, was talking this last Tuesday night, our adult small group, and uh, I was showing fart videos, and it was fantastic. So, videos I've shown up here before. Um, so, anyway, uh, here's, here's, we're going to shift gears just a little bit because uh, we want this to be a place, obviously, that we can share the fun stuff, the great stuff, but also the stuff that's a little bit more on the serious end of things, and uh, we don't talk about things unless we feel like it's absolutely essential. Um, and so you guys are probably aware, have you, how many of you guys have heard that like mental health has, it's kind of like at an all time low ever since COVID? You guys heard that? Um, seen statistics maybe thrown around about that? So um, that means rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, stuff like that has kind of gone up quite a bit in the last few years. Um, and so today, one of the things that we're, actually the, the main thing we're going to be focusing on is suicide. Uh, it's a heavy topic, uh, and the reason we're talking about it is one, because statistically, many more people are dealing with su suicidal ideation uh, or thoughts um, than ever before. Two, because statistically speaking, there's at least one to three people in this room, based on the numbers we have right now, that know somebody uh, who this has affected them. And, uh, and four, we want to create safe places for you to be able to talk about things or even prepare you for how to think about things even if you haven't dealt with them before. Make sense? So we, we, be, we believe that the best thing to do in anything in life is to be prepared. And uh, one of the ways we can be prepared is even if you're not dealing with anything like this yet or you don't know anybody who's dealing with this yet, the odds are you will. And so it's important to talk about this kind of stuff. Now, if this stuff has already affected you personally because of thoughts or, or anything that you've had, or because you know somebody who has committed suicide, then this is going to be a little bit heavier for you because you have personal experience to relate back to this. So that, that's okay. Um, and, and we want to, again, provide a place for you to talk about this in an open way. This is stuff that we've talked about throughout the years here at Victory because it's important. Um, but just in full transparency, this is something that hits me personally a little bit differently this time around that we're talking about it. Because in the last two months, I've known somebody personally um, that has, has, has committed suicide. Um, and I'm not going to share their name because it's still really fresh. And to be honest, I haven't really fully processed it yet either because... Um, you know, there's all kinds of feelings you'll talk about within your group, but it's weird for me. I live eight hours from my hometown, and both people that took their own lives from my life in the last couple months were people that I knew growing up when I was your age and all through high school. One of them I knew since, you know, like kindergarten, first grade. Um, but now I live eight hours away, and I haven't talked with them in like a decade. So uh, it feels weird for me. One of them did take their own life uh, intentionally, um, and one of them accidentally overdosed. And so this is, this is something that, for me, is, is very personal. And you know, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? And how do you process that and, and do it in a healthy way? So as we talk about this today, it's not just something that um, is, a, is a good topic to cover, but it's something that's, that's personal for me as well. Um, so you guys aren't alone in dealing with this, if this is something that you're dealing with. Um, but some questions I want you to ask within your small group right now. Um, I've got a couple things 
You'll talk within your group, you'll, you'll kind of process a couple questions and then we'll come back and I'll keep talking. But um, one would be what thoughts or feelings come to your mind when you heard we're talking about suicide today? And secondly, on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable do you feel talking about this topic? So I'll give you guys about five minutes to discuss this within your group and then uh, you can draw your attention back here and we'll continue on. So, um, while I don't know exactly what you guys said in your group, I can promise you that it is completely normal to have different feelings and thoughts on this. Um, and no matter how you guys would rate that, personally, I would rate this on a scale of like three, how comfortable I am talking about this, just because it's not fun to talk about. Um, and it's heavy. And, uh, and I wish it's something we didn't have to talk about. Um, so that's just, that's just where I'm at personally. Some of you are like, man, I'm glad we're talking about it because then I can at least be open and like hear from other people's perspectives on this issue, you know? Um, and so the, it, it's, it's good to be able to have a space where you can process no matter where you're at in your level of comfortability when it comes to this stuff. But uh, here, here's what I want to do. Um, your, your small groups have uh, a, a a little wheel that'll help you describe your feelings at some point if you need to refer to that. But um, it also, we've, we've got a little deck of cards here where we're going to talk through some definitions and terms that we'll refer to during this talk. So um, to help us get on the same page, I want you guys to each um, work as a team and come up to try to pair the words with the definitions. And uh, once you do that, we'll, we'll see how you guys did. So go ahead and get those flashcards out and see if you can pair the definition with, uh, with the term. So let's see how you guys did. Suicide, the definition. When someone ends their own life on purpose. Okay, suicide attempt is when someone tries to end their life on purpose but doesn't succeed. Okay, which does happen. Suicidal thoughts when someone thinks about or considers ending their life. Suicidal threat is when someone talks about or writes that they will attempt to end their life. Intrusive thoughts are unwanted and unpleasant thoughts, images and urges that can pop into our heads without warning and for no reason. Hopelessness is when someone believes that life can't get better. Worthlessness is when someone feels unimportant or that they have nothing valuable to offer the world. And brokenhearted is a feeling of deep and complete sadness. A hope is confidence that something good can come out of anything. So, how'd you guys do? Did you get them all? All right, A plus. I like it. So, uh, let's, let's just say that you're someone who's struggling with suicidal thoughts or has experienced any of these things on this list. I want you to know you do not have to be ashamed of feeling any of these things, okay? The point of talking about this and putting a definition to the term is so that we can talk openly about it. All right, there, there's been lots of psychologists study this kind of thing, and, and it seems statistically that people who are open about it and talk about it more are less likely to follow through on this kind of thing. Okay? Talking about it, in, the, in other words, those who hide these feelings, if you're feeling any of these things that are negative, um, those feelings are likely to grow more intense unless you have a healthy way to talk through it. Make sense? So that's, uh, again, another reason why we're putting these terms to their definitions and, and doing that. Now, I know that it's probably really difficult stuff to talk about if you're one that is dealing with this kind of stuff. Um, and, and so um, we, we want to just provide an opportunity to ask some of the hard questions. So question number four, you're going to do this with your group. What questions do you have about these words or definitions? I'll give you guys just a minute or two because we got to keep moving along. So what questions do you have about these words or definitions? Go. I'm going to hold those. You'll have more time to talk here at the end. But unfortunately, there's no simple answers to these questions. We start getting into causation and then, you know, uh, it, it, it can go in infinite numbers of ways. Um, our goal today really isn't to answer all these questions but to get them out in the open so we can know, hey, here's some things we need to go look for for answers. Um, and as far as treatment or how to work through these questions, again, there's lots of things and lots of resources for that. But ultimately, uh, what most of this boils down to are some of the last definitions in those flashcards, okay? Um, much of 
this issue comes down to feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness, okay? Uh, in other words, people feel like life isn't worth living or going forward if it's going to feel like this. There's no hope for it to change, and there's, there's no way to see that it's worth getting any better. And, and when those two things add up, it is a bad recipe for this kind of stuff. And so, um, how, how do we address this? How do we address maybe hopelessness and worthlessness? Now, unfortunately, again, I don't have all the answers, but we're going to point to some scripture, and we're going to talk about something that I think is going to be very impactful and relevant for this conversation. But first, I want you to just give me a, a show of fingers. You could talk about this within your groups. But for, for the sake of time, we're just going to take a quick poll here and look to your groups to, to give your answer. But on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you think God cares about what you're feeling? especially if it's this kind of stuff. Hold up on your fingers, scale of one to 10, how much do you feel like God cares about this kind of stuff? Okay, I'll give you just a couple seconds to think about it. Okay, if your answer is anything but 10 out of 10, then, then that's an issue because God absolutely cares 100% about how you feel, especially when it comes to something as big as this. And oftentimes if we're struggling with hopelessness or worthlessness, then we'll rate that less than 10 because we'll feel like there's no hope and I'm not worthy of it because God doesn't care about it. That's, that's ultimately where, where we come to um, when it comes to this kind of stuff. So God really does care about how we're feeling. And, and how do we know that? Well, God revealed to us through his word and through his people throughout history cases where this is true. The ultimate one being Jesus dying on the cross for our sins because he stopped at nothing to come and rescue us from our sin, from our depravity, from our brokenheartedness. But secondly, because there's all kinds of personal testimony throughout the history of God's people that talk about this. And specifically, we're going to go to one of the Psalms. We're going to talk about David. Now, if you don't know anything about King David, um, before he was king, he was the shepherd boy that was, th that was discarded and like not even counted as a son to his father. He was cast out into the fields to, to watch after the sheep, which was the job of an outcast, somebody who wasn't accepted. And so um, if you know the story, Samuel, the prophet, came to Jesse's house to look for the next king of Israel. Um, and Jesse brought out all of his sons, except for David. He didn't consider David to be one of his sons, um, which tells you something about how maybe David probably felt about himself, not even being accepted by his own family. Maybe some of you can relate to that. But then, but then God sees things that man doesn't see. And so ultimately, God anoints David to be king. It's only after that that David then goes on. He, he defeats Goliath, even though he wasn't supposed to be there. He was just delivering lunch for his brothers. And, uh, and, and then he goes on. He wins the affection of the people. People cheer that David has slain his ten thousands. And, and he goes and leads people into battle. And Saul obviously gets jealous of this, who is the current king of Israel and doesn't like David because David is now a threat to his rule because he knows he's been disobedient to God and he's the reason that David has been anointed at all. So Saul and in his insecurity and in his sin decides to go after David and kill him. So David knows he's wanted, dead or alive, mostly dead. And so he runs. He gets out of Dodge and he's on the run for years, right? David knows he's going to be the next king. God has given him this promise, yet everything in his life points to that being not true. And so David runs, he hides, he's separated from, from family, from friends, from anything good and anything familiar in his life. And he's on the run. And, and, and so after years of this, David writes down this psalm where he is in despair. But he goes, he writes this. He says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. This is in Psalm chapter 34, verse 18. Now you hear that word brokenhearted. Let's maybe define that a little bit. It's that feeling of deep and complete heartache. You know when you, you feel so sad that it makes your heart hurt? You guys been that way? Uh, ever felt that before? It's, it's where you just, like, you can't get out of a funk. You can't get out of thinking whatever it is that happened that made you feel that way or whatever. But you're in such grief and pain that your heart literally hurts. You have chest contractions or, or pain. You, you feel like, you feel physically what you would describe is going on emotionally. And, and, and it's a feeling of deep, complete heartache. 
And here's what David knows to be true, that no matter how bad our circumstances can get, no matter how hopeless we feel, no matter how alone or misunderstood we might feel, God is still always with us. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And, and so when we feel hopeless, God wants to be close to us. When we feel afraid, God wants to be close to us. When we feel depressed, God wants to be ho- close to us. When we feel worthless, God wants to be close to us. When we feel so much pain or sorrow or sadness that our hearts feel like they're actually aching, God wants to be close to us. So uh, I, that's encouraging to me to just know, but I, I want you to talk about this in, in your groups for a minute. So a couple questions to talk. I'll give you just a couple minutes in your group. Why, does it, it, why is it sometimes difficult to believe that God is near when you feel brokenhearted? Because I know there's sometimes a disconnect between knowing that he's close and actually feeling like he is. And, and secondly, does God, or does knowing God gives you, uh, does knowing that God is with you give you more hope in this situation? Why, or why not? So talk about that with your group for just a couple seconds, and then, and then we'll move on. The bottom line, what I want you guys to remember from today is that God gives us help, and he gives us hope. Um, now, memorizing this verse, first of all, would be a great first step, but I recognize that sometimes even knowing the truth or memorizing the verse doesn't always give us everything that we need because sometimes our own bad thoughts will, will try to tell us like that it's not true. And sometimes we need a little more help and God gives us help. He gives us a support system first and foremost, and then he gives us tools to help us with whatever it is that we're going through, even this issue. And I know that because there are tons of people who have been in this position of suicidal ideation and have wanted to end their lives, even people who have attempted to end their lives. And yet, God intervenes, God provides support, and people come out of it. They come out on the other side and never wrestle with it ever again. And so there is hope. There are people who have conquered it, and the same can be true for you or anybody who else is, who is dealing with it. So God gives us help, and he gives us hope. So let's talk about practically what that might look like, okay? Um, so if you were, we're going to go through se- several different groups of people here, and then you guys can finish out the discussion with your small group. So if you are somebody that is struggling with suicidal thoughts, one, identify those thoughts, right? Start by recognizing the unpleasant, intrusive, or suicidal thoughts that you're having. Catch yourself repeatedly thinking about them or harming yourself and identify them so that, two, you can tell somebody you trust, okay? As soon as you start feeling this way, that should be a red flag in your head because it's not normal, and you should tell somebody that you trust that can help you uh, to work through it or take you to somebody who can help you through it, right? Um, So you'll talk with that in your group in just a second. Second group of people I want to talk to is if you've never experienced suicidal thoughts, but you have a friend or a loved one who is struggling with them, um, then one, I want you to take their words seriously, okay? Uh, If someone shares that they're thinking about ending their own life, believe them, okay? One of the the top things that, that friends say after hearing about a friend has just ended their life is, I had no idea, or, oh, I... I didn't take them seriously when they said that they were dealing with this kind of stuff. I thought this is just something that sometimes people say it out of a joking way because they don't know how to talk about it in a serious way. So uh, if, if somebody talks about it, take it seriously, okay? Even if they aren't really dealing with it, but they are just joking about it, they should know that if they were to ever deal with that, you're going to take it seriously. And that's not a joking matter. So. If somebody brings it up about their own life, take it seriously. Um, And then secondly, you talk to a trusted adult. Say, hey, so-and-so said this. I don't know if they're joking or not, but uh, I feel like I should just say this was talked about. Tell your parent, tell their parents, tell a coach, tell a teacher, tell a a trusted adult that knows both of you um, so that this can come out in the open, okay? A lot of times your friends who are struggling with this might joke or talk about it with you, but they would never tell an adult. So, so I, I know it puts you in an awkward position as a friend because you don't want to betray their trust, but you are helping them out in the long term by taking that to a trusted adult. Make sense? Okay. I recognize it's hard, uh, but that's the best thing that you can do. Okay. Uh, you and your friend can work through the perceived betrayal of trust 
you can't work through the ending of a life. So you have to take that uh, with perspective. The last group of people I want to talk to is that if, if you know somebody who has died by suicide, um, if someone you love or care about, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss. It, it's incredibly difficult to talk about and, and it only brings up more questions. So one, I want you to know it's not your fault. Um, even if you feel like there's something you could have done differently, at the end of the day, they made the choice that they made and that's not on you. Um, there are contributing factors and there are layers to this um, of which you are not at fault. There's m many steps along the way that they had to take in order to get to that point. And so recognize that it's not your fault and there's not a thing that you really probably could have done to change the outcome. Two, it's okay to have lots of feelings. It's okay to be mad at them for the decision. It's okay to be filled with grief and heartache about it. Uh, there's a whole range of emotions and they're all okay for you to feel. Three, talk to someone you trust. You might recognize this theme, no matter which group that you're in. Talk to somebody about the stuff that you're, you're dealing with. You have to be able to process stuff openly and verbally. Um, and if you keep it inside, it's not gonna be healthy. So talk with someone that you trust because the truth of the matter is that no matter where you are in this conversation, no matter where you are in the spectrum of, emo uh, of emotions or feelings or thoughts, God can give you help and he can give you hope. So, so remember that. And uh, I'm gonna give you guys the rest of the time to talk within your groups um, and, and kind of process some of the questions. Group leaders, I'll let you kind of cherry pick what questions are most important based on kind of where your group is at um, because you'll have a better feel on that than I will. There's, there's lots of questions you could discuss but I'll, I'll give it to you guys to finish out this conversation. Um, and most importantly, as you close, make sure you pray. Close your time in prayer together. Pray for each other. Pray for those who are dealing with this stuff. And, and pray that you will have the courage that it takes to be the friend that those people need when the time comes. Okay? Hopefully you never have to deal with this. But in case it does, I want you to be prepared. And so... Um, that's all I'll say about that. I love you guys. I hope you feel that. I hope you feel that from your group leaders. I hope you recognize that this is a safe area that you can talk through these kinds of things. Um, nothing to be ashamed of. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to your groups. You can finish out the conversation and then we'll be done for the week.